Right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, Dr. Yu. Um, am I pronouncing your surname correctly? Perfectly. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for joining us from uh, Delhi. <laughs> Um, the talk today is about the great economists, how their ideas can help us today by Professor Linda Yu uh, of Oxford. Welcome to uh, all our new participants from all over the UK as, as well as some from uh, Europe mainland. Welcome to our members and supporters. This talk is being hosted by the United Nations Association of Harpenden. This group was uh, set up back in 1945, that's where I was born. Uh, today, we have over 200 supporters from Harpenden, St. Albans, and surrounding villages in the English county of uh, uh, Hertfordshire. We are a people's movement supporting the goals and objectives of the United Nations. There's no membership fee to join us. Professor Linda Yu is a fellow in economics at Edmund Hall, Oxford University, and an adjunct professor of economics, London Business School. She's also a visiting professor at LSE Ideas and chair of the LSE Economic Diplomacy Commission. Her latest book, which I've bought um, and I'm reading through, <laughs> The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today, was the Times Best Business Books of the Year and Newsweek Magazine's Best Books of the Year. So uh, for, for us, Scientist, it's a great introduction to economics. Um, so I'm really enjoying. Uh, I've just finished Karl Marx. <laughs> so um, before I hand over to you, Dr. Yu, a few housekeeping uh, and other points. Um, our next meeting in March will be the Agonies of Empire, the Second American Civil War, question mark. But Professor Mick Cox of the London School of Economics which will be held at the Salvation Army Hall in Harpenden on Saturday, 18th of March. Uh, if anyone new to us wishes to subscribe or attend uh, or get our free newsletter, please email me at una.harpenden at gmail.com. The format of the session today will be a talk for about 30 minutes or so, uh, followed by a Q&A session for another 30 minutes or so. Participants may post a question at any time in the chat function, which will be picked up later in the Q&A session. Alternatively, you may click on the raise hand icon and ask your question during the Q&A session. Um, a link to the recording of the talk will be shared via our website and our next newsletter. So everyone will be put on mute except the speaker during the, during the talking part of the session. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Linda Yu. Thank you very much. Um, how lovely uh, to uh, be able to speak about my book. Uh, it takes about two, three years to write it. And so it's always a welcome opportunity to, uh, to talk about it. And I think your, the aims of your association are certainly laudable. I actually had the privilege of speaking at the United Nations on the SDG. Uh, they do an annual SDG forum. Uh, so I was actually there last July. I'm very happy to um, draw up more of those um, ideas from history to see how it can help us achieve uh, these important goals by 2030. Uh, so I'm going to uh, share a few slides um, and um, and go through um, those uh, in about uh, 30 minutes. Um, and I very much look forward to uh, your questions and a discussion. So um, so the great economists. Um, so this book, um, the subtitle is. Um, how their ideas can help us today. So what it omits, the subtitle, which I actually put on the uh, the title slide here, um, it's actually um, each chapter is a mini biography. So it's a it's a short um, biography of uh, the great economists, uh, their life, because I think to understand somebody's ideas requires understanding their life, the context, the historical time in which they live. 
to help us understand why um, certain theories came about, um, and then um, applying those to today to solve some of our biggest problems. Uh, I mentioned at the start there, uh, the UN uh, SDGs. Um, a lot of those um, relate to, not exclusively, uh, clearly there are many broader goals, um, but the economic ones touch on some of the biggest challenges um, that we do face um, as, a, as, a, as a world, which is, you know, why are so few countries rich? Um, do we face a slow growth future? And these are questions that great economists have actually grappled with um, for decades. Um, so uh, that is the uh, the uh, the structure of the book, as every chapter is self-contained, chapter on wages, chapter on growth, chapter on inequality, another big um, important goal uh, that we all share um, in terms of reducing um, and, and seeing what we can learn from history. Uh, the first caveat I would give is um, actually Mark Twain, the writer, the American writer, said it well. He said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> so no lesson from history would be a perfect parallel to today. Um, but I think there are insights that we can learn and learn to avoid <laughs> from the mistakes of the past um, as we try and uh, grapple with some of these big challenges uh, looking ahead. So I want to just give a, I suppose, a broad historical sweep, uh, starting from the middle of the 19th century. Uh, my book actually starts in the middle of the 18th century, but I'm going to start with the middle of the 19th century. Um, about how economic ideas have actually um, shaped the world. So um, the reason I start with this is I think sometimes um, economics as a subject has become quite technical, has quite become quite mathematical. And actually, one of the great economists I write about, Irving Fisher, is responsible for that because <laughs> he introduced mathematics and moved the headquarters of economics from um, Britain to uh, America at the start of the 20th century. Um, but even he tackled some really big questions. And I think this is a good reminder of the way that economics as a subject can contribute to big questions that actually shape our world. So I'm going to start with the end of protectionism um, in the middle of the 19th century, just to give you an example of how um, uh, some of the ideas that are in the book and some of the ideas that certainly have shaped our world. So this is when the Corn Laws were repealed in 1846. So the Corn Laws were a protectionist piece of legislation that imposed a 100% import tariff on imported grains. It benefited landowners who could therefore be protected from foreign competition. And this um, was a period also of mercantilism. So up until this point, um, if you look back at uh, the previous centuries, um, mercantilism is this idea that countries should run trade surpluses. Now, many of you are probably thinking, I have heard that idea recently. <laughs> Ideas never die. They just come back in a different guise. <laughs> and it used to be that mercantilism, this idea that trade surpluses were the aim, um, meant that, uh, you know, restricting imports, so imports, are not exceeded by exports, which is the definition of a trade surplus, seem to be the overriding paradigm. Um, but it was through the efforts of great economists, um, starting with Adam Smith, known as the father of economics, and then um, his disciple of sorts, and I'll come back to that in a moment, David Ricardo, um, that began to challenge this idea and introduce the concepts of absolute advantage and comparative advantage. And it was this notion that through trade and exchange, uh, countries um, can actually uh, specialize and grow more efficiently. Um, that began to change the thinking around mercantilism and the repeal of the Corn Laws. And this required changing the mind of the pri then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, who after repealing the Corn Laws and his second time as Prime Minister ended up losing uh, his office due to a couple of other things as well. Um, so, um, but anyways, he repealed the court laws and it heralded this, this era of globalization. Um, you know, so indeed, you know, I am uh, currently uh, in Delhi. I was uh, due to come back to the UK, but um, I ended up extending my stay. I mean, we take this now for granted <laughs> that you could you could trade, you could live, you could travel. And um, and it is because of the advent of globalization. And that was an idea brought about by great economists. Um, so 
that idea carried through until the um, latter part um, of the 19th century as the kind of dominant paradigm. Um, but then, um, as with all these things, the ideas came under challenge. So the end of the 19th century call, um, saw what became known as the Great Depression of the 19th century, also known as the Long Depression. It was the first time that unemployment um, appeared in the dictionary. It was the rise of trade unionism. And all of that was in reaction to a big financial crisis that uh, contributed to the Long Depression and the extent of inequality of having this um, increased capitalism and commercialization and globalization. So that period is also known in the United States as the Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age actually famously captured in novels by F. Scott Fitzgerald, like The Great Gatsby, was a period of extreme inequality as well as, as I say, financial crises. And this, um, this sense that globalization and capitalism wasn't working for everyone. So the rise of trade unionism was also facilitated by the rise of Marxism. So Karl Marx, um, a German economist, he saw exactly the same capitalist industrial revolution as Adam Smith and the classical economists like David Ricardo, but he felt that it led to exploitation of workers and therefore the natural conclusion is crises and then communism uh, would be uh, in imposed equality. So this battle of ideas raged on in the early part of the 20th century. And in fact, at one point about half the world's population lived in either communist or partly socialist regimes. And it meant that capitalists began to reform their ideas of welfare state capitalism. So in other words, the capitalism of the 19th century and the 18th century didn't include a safety net or, or a welfare state. Um, and it took neoclassical economists like Alfred Marshall uh, to see that introducing social protection didn't disincentivize work. And that evidence and this battle of ideas drove a shift in thinking about what kind of economic system works best. And that was eventually led to the introduction of the welfare state facilitated in the interwar years, and then certainly um, in the post-war period, which saw the uh, development of the National Health Service, uh, social security systems in the United States, as well as um, in Europe. And this transformed uh, capitalism. And then the fall of communism really dating to the late 1980s, and then um, uh, notably with um, the end of the communist um, regimes in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, that seemed to bring about another consensus that um, welfare state capitalism um, and, uh, you know, seeing um, the reforms meant that it had, um, as an economic system, um, worked better than a communist system. But by the late latter part of the 1990s, there was again discontent with globalization. There were anti-globalization protests, notably against the World Trade Organization in Seattle in 1999. And then there was, um, again, high levels of inequality in the US known as the second Gilded Age in the 21st century. And so I think we are at a time in which the economic consensus has again broken down and we are again seeing a battle of ideas about how to tackle some of our biggest challenges. Um, and so that context, um, I think, is just worth bearing in mind as I now briefly go through the great economists and some of the, um, the challenges and what their ideas can help us understand about them. So the great economists themselves, I have actually placed them on a rough spectrum. This is a very uh, rough spectrum. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have very uh, Karl Marx, who believes that the state should uh, should uh, control production, central planning, command economy. And the other side, you have free market economists. Um, so Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman um, is known for lots of things, uh, but he originally actually opposed the creation of the Federal Reserve in its modern form because he didn't think you needed a central bank. The market should be able to uh, to dictate quite a few things. And then most economists actually sit in between. So um, Adam Smith, I mentioned, uh, classical economists, neoclassical economists. I put John Maynard Keynes sort of in the middle of the state and the market because the Keynesian revolution in the 1930s transformed economics. Um, it essentially introduced um, a role for government um, and the importance of the medium term. His famous quote is, um, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. 
And so if you waited for uh, neoclassical economics to write the Great Depression, it was uh, going to take so long, it may as well just. Uh... So this idea that government intervention could actually make a difference is why he kind of sits where um, he sits. Um, so that's a rough uh, taxonomy of the great economists that I cover. Um, and of course, within every chapter, their disciples, um, you know, also who've advanced their work um, is mentioned as well. So I think just very briefly going through the great economists before I tackle some of the challenges, I've already mentioned Adam Smith, uh, the Wealth of Nations is a seminal work published in 1776. He's famous for the idea of the invisible hand within markets, that the supply and demand of markets uh, determine allocation, but presuming you have well allocated property rights and zero uh, transaction costs. So it's not a free market uh, premise. It is that the market plays um, a role, an efficient role in allocating resources. And just as I was saying before, these great economists um, all embrace the big ideas of the day. They actually wanted to make an impact on how uh, the economy was constituted. And the Wealth of Nations is itself a great example. He spent 10 years writing it. He timed the publication for 1776. Now, that was the year of the War of Independence at the uh, US colonies. And his um, position was that uh, Britain should stop this ruinous war with the Americans and that we could trade just as well with the Americans, um, uh, regardless of whether or not they were uh, colonies or not of Great Britain. Uh, David Ricardo, I've already mentioned, uh, father of international trade, comparative advantage. He also coined the term rent seeking. Now he wasn't a, he's known as a classical economist, but he wasn't a uh, a disciple of Adam Smith in the sense that they were contemporaries because they weren't. And in fact, he never met Adam Smith. But David Ricardo, uh, just very briefly, um, is actually um, a, uh, he was a stockbroker and he uh, became uh, very wealthy. And I guess when you become very wealthy, you become bored. I wouldn't know. So he, he, uh, he taught himself economics after picking up a copy of The Wealth of Nations when he was um, on holiday in Bath. Um, he taught himself economics, he bought a seat in parliament, and then he began to, beca he became uh, one of the most influential policymakers as well as great economists. And rent seeking, of course, refers to the landlords uh, that he was um, critical of. Um, because of the protectionist uh, stance that they took. Um, so Dave Ricardo, known for lots of things, uh, rent seeking, Ricardian equivalents, he's been hugely influential. I try not to give that example um, when I'm teaching because I don't think it's the best role model since he never studied economics formally. But anyways, moving on. Um, so Karl Marx, um, so I've already described uh, his role uh, in, uh, in the idea. And by the way, his uh, co-author, um, is probably the least appreciated um, co-author. I always end up thinking Marx is credited with the Communist Manifesto, with uh, Das Kapital, um, but actually volumes three and four were actually finished by Friedrich Engels, um, who was also the co-author of the Manifesto. Um, and Marx, by the way, did not live to see the communist revolution. Um, so the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, and in fact, Capital um, and Communist Manifesto was first translated into Russian. Um, he never, he died actually before that. Um, and so um, uh, he never saw the sweep of uh, communism that followed from the Soviet Union. And then later on uh, chi in China, uh, Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea. Um, Alfred Marshall, uh, I mentioned him briefly, the father of neoclassical economics. Uh, he introduced uh, demand and supply curves. And as I say, he was a late Victorian um, in the period when the consensus broke down and the late Victorians started talking about um, helping the deserving poor. So this is the period of the rise of philanthropy. Um, you can think of Charles Dickens novels that capture that period. Um, and it was the transformation of Adam Smith's um, capitalist system into the welfare state capitalist system um, that happened um, during uh, his time. Um, so uh, Irving Fisher, <laughs> I mentioned him as well at the beginning. Um, he's probably the first 
great American economist. The reason, by the way, he's never heard of in books like this, and he rarely gets mentioned. He certainly doesn't have the name recognition of a Keynes or an Adam Smith. It's because um, in the um, fall of 1929, um, he famously predicted that the stock market um, was at a permanently high plateau right before the great crash of 1929. It destroyed his reputation. It actually destroyed his fortune because he was the inventor of a Rolodex type device. Um, and um, he uh, invested in the stock market. He wasn't just an entrepreneur, he was actually an investor. So he lost everything and then became indebted to his sister-in-law until her death. Um, so his, uh, his reputation, uh, means that he's never included in books like this. However, Irving Fisher introduced mathematics into the subject. He moved the headquarters of economics to the United States. He's also known for lots of influential works, um, including that deflation theory. Uh, and this is the theory studied by Ben Bernanke and others um, that prevented the global banking crisis from 10 years ago from becoming um, like the 1930s um, because they looked at um, debt deflation theory by Irving Fisher. He's also the father of the Fisher equation, all sorts of um, really uh, notable uh, concepts in economics. And that's why he's included um, in the book. Keynes I've already uh, described, uh, credited with ending the Great Depression by introducing government um, intervention. Keynes was also the architect um, along with um, Harry Dexter White at the Bretton Woods Institution, so coming to kind of the areas of global policymaking. So Keynes also hugely influential outside of economics and Britain as well. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through all of them, so I'm just going to uh, quickly introduce them and then move to the great concept, uh, the concepts um, and the issues. Joseph Schumpeter, um, he's best known for creative destruction, uh, this idea of innovation and companies, very Darwinian. But his best known book was his 1942 book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. So again, a technical economist who actually weighed in on the big issues of the day. And his argument was for capitalism and against socialism um, and the importance of democracy. Friedrich Hayek, um, hugely influential uh, behind the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions of the 1980s. Uh, his best known book, again, embraces the big ideas of that battle of ideas, um, The Road to Serfdom, which is a play on Alexei de Tocqueville's um, treatise on the United States. And his version um, was to argue against communism, which he argued was a road to serfdom. So it's all this embracing of the big policy challenges, I think, which is what makes these great economists great. Joan Robinson, um, women at that time and the early part of the 20th century even uh, could study economics but couldn't get a degree. Um, so it made it very challenging to be a professional economist. She was an exception. Um, we can talk a bit more um, about that. Um, she, um, her concept that she's best known for is monopsony, which is monopoly in the labor market. This is the idea now being considered by policymakers to try and understand why wages are so low. And so she remained hugely um, influential um, in terms of her theories um, to today. Milton Friedman, I mentioned him briefly as a libertarian. Um, his best known work um, is The Monetary History of the United States written with um, Anna Jacobs and Shorts. And they explained the Great Depression through a contractionary monetary policy. And this again is another um, seminal um, piece of work that helps us um, understand um, what policy should do in the face of a, of a systemic banking crisis. Douglas North, now he is a fascinating character, the father of new institutional economics. Um, he, essentially, um, those who follow his work um, include Darren S. Moglu and James Robinson, so economists, political scientists working together, and that's what he introduced, cross-disciplinary work around why nations fail, why are so few countries poor. He looked at all of these great economists I've just described, and he said, all of you have gotten it wrong. <laughs> All your models are around capital, labor, technology, you're missing institutions. This is actually what explains why so few countries um, are rich. And so um, 
He introduced cross-disciplinary work and remains extremely influential, especially in the area of development. Um, Robert Solo, um, he's the only great economist I uh, write about who's still alive. <laughs> he's in his 90s. And his ideas written in the 1950s um, are around how countries grow. So in this chapter, I focus on the solo paradox. This is very pertinent to the UK, which is facing a productivity um, slowdown and very slow growth in productivity. It's called the solo paradox. You can see the computer age everywhere except the productivity data. And so this, um, he's the final great economist. Um, there are rivalries, as you've probably gathered, these economists come at the issues in very different uh, ways. So the famous one is between uh, Keynes and Hayek. Keynes always had an advantage over Hayek. Hayek was Austrian. Um, Hay uh, Keynes was known for his pithy sayings like, you know, um, you know, a speculator is one who runs risks of which he is aware. An investor is one who runs risks of which he is unaware. Whereas Friedrich Hayek, um, his students at the Lenin School of Economics asked him to lecture in German because it would be more understandable. So this rivalry inspired two Hamilton-like uh, uh, videos that I have there. Um, where rappers wrap out uh, their different explanations for the Great Depression and then the 2009 Great Recession. It's got millions of views, um, but it's in a, but the other thing I always stress um, on this uh, rivalry is it was over ideas. It was not ad hominem. Keynes was the elder of the two. And when Keynes passed away, um, Hayek wrote to his widow and said that Keynes was the greatest man he had ever known. And this is after insulting him by saying Keynes's general theory was in general because it was only in respect of a depression. <laughs> so that is very insulting <laughs> for, uh, for economists. And yet Keynes was the greatest man he had ever he had ever known. So um, I'm going to finish off with just uh, the issues that I cover in the book. And I very much look forward to uh, the q and I can see some questions in the chat already so I can tailor uh, the application of these concepts to the questions that you're most interested in. So the economic challenges that I cover in the book, the ideas I draw on are on the screen. Um, basically, should we worry about rebalancing the economy towards manufacturing? Do trade deficits even matter? Can China grow rich? Is inequality inevitable? Are we at risk of repeating the 1930s? To invest or not invest? Um, shall we borrow to invest? Um, and then what drives innovation? Uh, how can we learn from financial crises? Why are wages so low? Are central banks doing too much? Why are so few countries prosperous? Do we face a slow growth future? And then the epilogue is, is globalization in trouble, uh, where I include Paul Samuelson, um, who is, I'm going to skip these um, slides, who, when he passed away recently, he was known as um, the last of the great economists, meaning they were generalists who embraced these big ideas. And one of his big ideas on globalization is that um, we should help the losers. So we've known since the days of David Ricardo that trade always creates losers because there'll be some sectors that expand and other sectors um, that don't. Um, so his argument is that we should use um, an ethical lens to judge uh, redistributive and pre-distributive policy. So redistributive is giving unemployment benefits afterwards. Pre-distributive is to invest in the skills of workers so that they can have an equal chance of receiving returns um, from their skills. Um, and um, both of these policies require money, requires funding. So, so his idea is derivative of um, John Rawls is a theory of justice where he proposes a veil of ignorance. So it's a very similar concept. So if you stand behind the veil of ignorance and you're presented with a policy, you have to decide whether you vote for or against the policy, not knowing whether or not you're going to pay more taxes or whether or not you are the unemployed person. And so he uses that idea to try and um, essentially um, try and, uh, you know, uh, reset globalization. So Samuelson um, is in the epilogue, which also covers um, 
Trump, Brexit, and a lot of the issues of, of the uh, very recent past. And then finally, so I said there, um, everybody um, seems to know um, that um, you know, uh, we've had losers from globalization since uh, David Ricardo wrote his book in the you know, 19th century. So why haven't we, have we done anything about it? And Samuelson, who was an advisor to US president said, I can't think of a president who has been overburdened um, by a knowledge of economics. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing the slides in a couple of moments, just a couple of quotes to finish off. To solve our economic problems, Robert Solow's advice is never claim more than you can justify. You gain respect um, by insisting on the qualifications not by appearing as if you know all the answers. Um, and then my favorite quote, which is actually John Robinson, uh, the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. And uh, so that's the, um, that's the book, The Great Economist, how their ideas can help us today. Um, and that's the U.S. edition. I'm not really sure why there's a, a different cover for the U.S. edition, um, but there is. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll pause there. Thank you uh, very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yu. Um, so uh, we shall start our Q&A sessions. And um, there are some questions already posed. Actually, most of them are mine. Shall we begin with those and then see who else has questions? Um, uh, participants, please feel free to write on the chat or raise your hands uh, as we go along. So if you want to take the first question, please. So um, capitalism in China is interesting to study. Which of the great economies that are alive today would be help China achieve a healthy balance between state and market capitalism? So it's a great question. Um, so the chapter on um, China that I have in the book is centered around the early influence of Marxism. I say early because um, Mao Zedong broke with uh, Marxism um, quite actually quite early on because um, he had a disagreement with the Soviet Union over the introduction of the Great Leap Forward. Um, and China moved into Maoism and uh, tried to become uh, more self-sufficient. Um, and of course, we know that the Great Leap Forward was an absolute disaster and of course, and you know, resulted in famine. And then there was the Cultural Revolution. And it wasn't actually until 1979 when Deng Xiaoping, having been purged, was then brought back, <laughs> um, that China started to introduce market-oriented reforms into its economy. So this combination of um, uh, a market um, being gradually inserted into a command economy, that process is actually ongoing in China today. So in the chapter, I write about the various economists who contributed to um, helping China address some of the issues with this transition. So in other words, um, you know, there are a number of issues with having, for instance, a state dominated financial system or having state owned enterprises, which are continuing to operate um, because they are less efficient than private firms um, on average. And they end up borrowing from the state owned banking sector, which then creates uh, potential debt issues for the state owned banking sector, the state owned controlled. Uh, financial system. And so this process of gradualism means that China avoided uh, the what's known as the transformational recessions of the former Soviet Union when it broke up in the 1990s. So um, this is Central Eastern Europe. Um, they all went through a decade-long recession. China avoided that. Um, however, um, China's reform is what's described as an easy to hard reform sequence. If you do it gradually, you go for the low hanging fruit. And now they're beginning to face some of the more challenging issues, especially around debt. So in the chapter, I write about um, all of that and um, and the uh, the economists who are trying to um, work within an increasingly fraught political system <laughs> to uh, to uh, to continue to uh, to promote these reforms. Um, so can China achieve a healthy balance between state and market capitalism? So I think that is remains to be um, seen because um, the question I pose, the title of the chapter is, can China grow rich? Um, and I write about this uh, in many places in the book, um, but it's really striking that only a quarter of the world's countries are high income. 
So the fact that very only, only 13 countries have become rich between 1960 and 2008, according to the World Bank, out of 101 middle income countries, that tells you how hard it is actually to become rich and to become high income. So if China were to um, achieve that, China has actually recently stopped talking about overcoming the middle income country trap, which is where most countries get stuck because the challenge of becoming rich is so significant um, that they may not actually achieve that. Now, China is a very unequal country. So that's not to say they have they have achieved a mixture of state and market, and it's so unequal, and it's such a big country that they probably have an upper income group, which rivals, you know, um, that of advanced economies. So, you know, the example I always give is I get great service when I go to Harrods until they work out I'm not Chinese. <laughs> so there are very wealthy Chinese, but I'm talking about the rest of the billion plus people um, you know, whose average incomes are still middle income to make them rich. I think that is um, yet to be seen. Um, next question is, in which developing or developed country have I found teaching economics most refreshing and why? Um, oh, I have a very limited uh, set. <laughs> so I'm going to have to say the UK because that's actually where I do all my pretty much all my teaching. I've had the pleasure of uh, teaching um, elsewhere. I will say, um, in Asia, they're slightly more deferential to um, professors <laughs> than they are in, uh, uh, in elsewhere. So, but it's fine. <laughs> you know, the Oxford system is tutorials. I actually like the uh, the back and forth, and so it's kind of strange to uh, to go to some Asian places and they're like, "What's the answer?" And I'm like, "What's the question?" <laughs> Uh, so, um, so yes, I think, you know, I mean that, you know, economics is a social science, uh, depends on behavior, depends on evidence, depends on context. So, you know, there's no, um, I think there is, you know, the, the, the interesting parts about how you can draw out economics to be relevant to improving people's lives, to policy, um, that also depends on the politics to me you know, that bit of economics, whether I teach or research it is the most interesting to me. Um, and then how unique is India's capitalism as is succeeding for the country as a whole without creating too much um, inequality? Yeah, so sitting in Delhi <laughs> is absolutely um, impressive, uh, the growth rates that India has achieved over the last, I would say, few years. I think the, you know, the, um, India also has, I would say, more of a mixed system um, in terms of its system. I wouldn't describe it as, you know, and I think this is, by the way, not uncommon uh, for lots of um, emerging markets. Now, uh, one of the, there's a couple of challenges, structural challenges. One of them does relate to um, uh, inequality in a sense, which is widespread educational attainment. Now, this is something that has characterized um, China's catch-up growth because China has very widespread educational enrollment. South Korea became a rich country on the back of substantial investment in primary education as well as secondary. I think there are issues structurally in India around that. The other issue, which I think is um, one of the most fascinating economic questions and India embodies it, is that India has because of its history, um, so it started with import substitution in the post-war period and then after in the 1980s and then after the 1991 balance of payments crisis, it began to um, move away from that and towards export oriented growth. But if you look at the share of industry as a share of GDP, it hasn't actually changed very much. It's begun to tick up in recent years, but this is what Danny Roderick calls premature deindustrialization. So moving from agriculture, not so much into manufacturing, but actually more into services. Can a country grow well on the back of a services specialization? So in the book I write about should government rebalance the economy because one of the characteristics of lots of countries is the services sector is the largest. So you go from industrialization to deindustrialization. Can you grow well if you're deindustrialized into services? The recent research on this, especially from the IMF, suggests that maybe because services today are so different than services, um, you know, 40 years ago. Um, just take the UK, very service-based economy, half of our exports value added is actually services. 
So to me, um, for a country like India, given its you know, extremely strong services sector, especially as an export sector as well. So that means the world is your market as well as your massive domestic market. I think the mixture of services and manufacturing has helped lift manufacturing as well. So I think India has huge promise. It certainly has the population and the demography and it's got the institutions, um, like I said, with these structural problems. So my hope would be that it could uh, grow without being too unequal because um, the Western model is not the only model of growth. Um, the East Asian countries that I mentioned, like South Korea, um, it's actually known for growing equitably. So it's growth with equity. And that's because they did a lot of pre-distribution. Um, and that focus on equality, that's a political choice. You know, that's absolutely possible. We've certainly seen um, that in East Asia. Uh, so moving on to a few other questions. What is wrong with UK capitalism? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, uh, why is it perceived as not being highly productive, increasing quality? Yeah, so, hmm, okay. So um, the UK, you know, I think for a start um, is a high income country. It has incredibly strong institutions. And until a decade ago, it didn't actually suffer the stagnant wages that has plagued America since the 1980s, or even uh, Japan and Germany, which had about 20 years of stagnant wages. But the UK is highly unequal uh, in the sense of the top 1%, not in the overall. It's not like the United States, which is why I was saying the second Gilded Age is actually an American problem. Um, the issues with the UK are around why is it that productivity growth has lagged? And that slowness in productivity growth goes back you know, years. This is not a recent last few years. This is not even a, well, okay, probably has to do with the banking crisis from 10 years ago. But the slowdown of growth from 2.5% to maybe half of that, um, that difference, um, you know, um, it's, 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 it goes to the heart of the services economy that I was describing. So there's, America is also very services orientated. So that's not the whole answer. But I do wonder if part of uh, the UK slow productivity growth is because it's dominated by services. Um, again, not the whole answer, but I think measurement is part of it. So the UK is less productive than continental Europe with the possible exception of Italy and some of the data. But services is pretty poorly measured. You know how many widgets you produce, but you know, services. Um, if you uh, sat in a meeting and it was a total waste of time, you know, plenty of those. In output terms, that's exactly the same as if you spent an hour doing something really productive in a meeting. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty badly measured. And then this idea of how can you raise output requires measurement. <laughs> and so I think there is something to that, but the main, I would say, a driver of the UK slow growth is actually um, low investment. So investment is low in the UK. It's about five percentage points lower than continental Europe. And, um, that um, is one of the reasons why um, the focus on investment, which invests in skills, invests in digital, in the green transition, all of that is hugely important. And the banking crisis has had an impact because the banking crisis meant that, you know, uh, investment was facing uncertainty, cost of borrowing was high, despite low interest rates, the government had high debt levels. So all of that, I think, contributed um, to that. And there's also a skills uh, gap in the UK as well. So I think this was put to me uh, pretty well, actually, by um, people who work in this in the science area, which is, you know, 50% uh, of our graduates don't go on to university. So, you know, are we giving them vocational opportunities like the very highly respected apprenticeship programs you would have in Germany? So it's there's a whole range of things, but investment in people and infrastructure and digital, I think this is this is going to be key. Because as I say, part of me is quite sympathetic to this idea of services, but given that the US is the same and they seem to have a lot of productivity, it's not the whole answer. Um, 
And then does my next book give, oh, actually the book does give answers uh, to, uh, to the questions that I pose. So the, every chapter is a question um, and, you know, in every, uh, and there's an answer in every chapter. So is inequality inevitable? Yes. Can China grow rich? Maybe. <laughs> Do we face a slow growth future? No, not necessarily. Um, should government rebounds the economy? Okay, but only if they're competent. <laughs> this is why I don't write out the answers right after the chapter titles. <laughs> you know, this is no joke uh, about economists, right? Harry Truman said, just give me a one-handed economist because it comes like on the one hand, on the other hand, but I actually do give answers. <laughs> I'm just not sure if they, uh, if I should. Um, Right. And then next question, uh, this one, um, surely these theories need to be revised in the context of limitations of growth because of the environment. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the um, the latest Nobel Prize, um, you know, winner was actually not the latest, but one of the latest is, is uh, Bill Nordhaus, who was uh, one of my professors at Yale and introducing uh, environment into growth models. Um, this is part of the evolution of how we think about, um, you know, these these great ideas. And it's actually one of the things that um, is quite uh, puzzling as well as troubling. Um, that there, that it took Bill Nordhaus until the latter part of the 20th century to write these models. When actually, in the late 19th century, um, you know, renewables were actually quite important, and in fact, renewables were you know on the ascendancy until cheap oil um, was discovered, and then that transformed the way that we use the um, the energy mix. So the next question about energy crisis, economic ideas, I think incorporating how you measure um, output and the cost of input. A lot of economics is around cost and benefit. Proper measurement there is absolutely key. And I think a lot of the work that Bill Nordhaus and then others with him and since um, his work um, try and do that so that economic growth, it's not just about the quantity, it's about the quality. And that is something that I write about quite a lot in the book, um, even in the absence of these seminal models. It is actually about the quality of growth. Is it greener? Is it more equal? My next book, um, which is out in May, The Great Crashes, um, actually writes about ESG and writes about the how you shift the paradigm um, so that the next crisis is not an environmental crisis, it's not a climate crisis. Um, and then do next one, do any of these economist theories emerge from a wider value and ethical concept and goals about what sort of society we want to achieve rather than successful capitalism intervention, globalization, communist systems? Yes, absolutely. So the last slide I shared about the ethical lens of um, Paul Samuelson, and again, that's derived from probably the greatest, one of the greatest political theorists of our time, the Harvard philosopher, John Rawls. Um, you know, there is a very deep tradition, especially um, in the part that you, it's more visible with the early economists like Adam Smith. It's more visible because he wasn't an economist. Adam Smith was a philosopher. <laughs> um, in fact, none of the early economists were actually economists. <laughs> they were all philosophers. And um, economics uh, was actually called political economy um, uh, for, you know, uh, really until I would say Alfred Marshall changed the name of the subject um, at Cambridge um, during the, uh, this is during the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. He, he didn't, he wanted to move it away from political economy um, because he thought the political part was becoming contentious. Remember Sir Robert Peel and <laughs> the court laws and everything. He considered calling it social economics because of all the behavior behind it. He settled on economics. Um, so going back to Adam Smith and the philosophers, um, you know, the um, a lot of the writing around economics, the big ideas, is actually the um, the ethical and moral foundations of economic um, relationships. So, for instance, welfare economics, which is a very basic, it's like the first lesson in uh, your Economics 101 <laughs> course, is around um, what are the underpinnings um, of the market. And it has to do, you know, and, and it's called welfare economics because the trades are, are measured not in terms of profit, but in terms of improvements in welfare. 
So something like a Pareto improvement means that this is a change in the market that increases welfare or utility to people, not the profits of firms. So the whole basis of utilitarianism, which of course is also a philosophical concept, is what underpins um, economics. And I think it was really the 1980s, which were very free market, <laughs> um, that it became the sort of very, um, you know, profit and, um, you know, shareholder, but actually economics as a broad sweep is much more concerned with utility uh, maximization um, than it is with profit maximization. I think um, I mentioned at the very beginning, the, the battle of ideas and the breakdown of consensus. The breakdown of consensus is around values. So, you know, we think inequality, broadly speaking, is too high. We think that wages are too low. Um, we think people are not rewarded for their efforts. Um, it's the quality of growth. It's not, it's not the quantity that causes the breakdown in consensus. It, um, it contrib crises always contribute to that. That makes you really rethink your values. Um, but that is, um, so yes, I think that, you know, that is the, um, uh, the premise, certainly of the early grade economists and maybe some of the later ones uh, less so. Um, in the context of solo slow growth uh, paradigm, how do you explain the paradox of the UK's chronic low productivity, low economic growth, and the sixth richest country in the world on the one hand, and our pioneering technological superiority in life sciences and the tech industry? Yeah, that's why it's the productivity paradox, <laughs> the solo paradox. So um, we used to be the fifth uh, largest um, economy. I think by some measures, India has overtaken us, but I think it's actually the French and that has to do with the exchange rate. Whole other, whole other topic there to discuss. Um, so the solo paradox essentially um, says, why don't these advances in innovation raise productivity across the economy? So yes, absolutely. The three strongest exports in the UK are life sciences, education, um, and financial services, financial business services. They're our biggest um, sectors. We're hugely productive in them. Um, but why doesn't that translate into raising productivity across the economy? And this is not a problem just for the UK. We just seem to have it worse than others, uh, probably because of our low investment. Um, lots of countries, South Korea, I've mentioned a few times, is facing slowing productivity growth. And um, there was only one period in the last 40 years in which productivity across the economy increased, and that was the late 1990s in the United States. And the reason was because um, instead of just inventing the technology, uh, businesses change the way that they work. So the example I like to give here is, it sounds so obvious, right? Um, but, you know, Zoom, we're on Zoom. <laughs> Zoom IPO'd before the pandemic. Um, they IPO'd in 2019. So the technology was there, but we didn't use it. Um, it wasn't part of business norms. It wasn't how people communicated with their colleagues, with their clients on webinars. So that ad adoption of technology, which sounds so obvious, is actually rarely done. <laughs> and so how do we raise productivity? We need to change the ways in which we use technology. So lots of people think technology is inventing. Yes, sure. But Zoom just improved an existing format. It just made it easy to use. So most increases in knowledge are not just the invention. It's the micro inventions which improve, adapt, and use. So I think we don't know the answer here. Remember my all my quotes about qualifications. We don't know all the answers, but I suspect part of the answer to the solo paradox and the productivity paradox is that we don't actually use the um, technology. We don't change um, the way in which we work. We don't um, adopt and adapt and implement um, the wonderful breakthrough. So I'll give you another example. Um, uh, I chair an investment company that only invests in uh, private uh, tech companies. And I, uh, I'm at a conference and uh, one of the speakers is, uh, he works for um, Epic Games, which is, I am speaking as if I know what gaming is. I don't really <laughs> invest in this and gaming is huge and Fortnite is a massive game the 
CPU, the chips, the processing, the technology they use for gaming is widely used in a range of industries for events, for movies, for cars. That's adoption, invention in one area like life sciences used somewhere else. That's what we need more of. We need widespread adoption of it. So, um, so I think that is, uh, that's probably one of the keys. Like I said, we knew the answer. Hopefully we'll be doing something about it. <laughs> Um, so moving on to the next question, uh, which of the great economists do you think is most relevant to solving economics um, problems of today? Um, it's a great question. I think um, if I had to choose, very hard, if I had to choose, um, ooh, this one is really hard. It. You know, so for me, quite a lot of my interest, a lot of my research is around economic growth and improving standards of living. So what we've just been discussing, the productivity paradox, the work of Robert Solo, I think that is hugely important. If we can raise productivity and get wages to rise in line with that and reward people and improve incomes in a way that's that's good, qualitatively good and for the way in which we live, to me, that would be um, you know, I think his ideas would be very, um, you know, would be very useful um, there. But anyways, it's like trying to pick your favorite puppy or something. You know, <laughs> you know a lot of their ideas are, are really, I think, um, you know, useful. And the next one, if you were retired and you had enough savings, which country would you live in <laughs> because of its economic and social success? Wow, another great question. Um, so uh, where would I live in? Um, well, given my limited language skills, does that factor into it? I might have to be English speaking because <laughs> I, although there's technology now where you could just have like a device and they'll, you know, if I say, can I have like, you know, fish and chips, they'll translate it and they'll, and they'll get it for you. No, it's a great question. I mean, I think I would just hope to, um, I mean, uh, I'm originally American, but I'm also British. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of things about, despite all the challenges we've just discussed, <laughs> I think there is a sense of British fairness. Um, there's a sense that I, I want to live in a society that um, wants to grow well qualitatively. I want to live in a society where it's fair. I want to live in a society where people queue in an orderly fashion. <laughs> so, so I would say the UK. Yeah. <laughs> despite everything that we said. And I speak the language. Although, as you know, it's a famous observation. Americans and Brits um, are divided by a common language. <laughs> so that's a whole other, whole other subject. Okay, next question. Would our assessment of growth be very different if we introduce a qualitative assessment? Yeah. I mean, I think this is why when we think about, you know, what is your measurement? So measurement of growth has changed a lot. We used to only look at GDP growth. And then um, I made a point of um, saying a few times that it's average income growth, it's standards of living. So it's GDP per capita. That's actually the better indicator of growth. You want to know, you know, and that also requires reducing inequality because if you have a highly unequal society, um, you know, that's not captured in GDP. Um, you can be, you can just have very few people going very, very rich. What you want is higher, um, you know, more people in the middle class. And the same thing with, you know, green growth and a more, uh, so equality, you know, greener growth, um, more inclusive growth. I think those things would move us away. And I think it's our, growth is already um, you know, moved away. Well-being, although that is quite hard to measure because, so again, as an American, you know, if you gave me, if you want me to rate my happiness from a scale of one to 10, it's probably like nine, just because, like, you know, and a, an equally happy British person would say like five. And it's just, you know, it is actually, it is actually, it is quite hard. Um, qualitative measures need context around it. So I always tell uh, my students, um, you know, you need to know what the measurement is for before you devise the measure. So if you want a more inclusive growth environment, lower inequality, that's what you should measure. You shouldn't measure GDP. You shouldn't even measure GDP per capita. You should actually look at measures of inequality and how much income goes to which, you know, which groups in society. So, uh, 
Um, and I think this is the final one, and we're coming up to the hour. Um, what is the role of the public sector wage increases in the NHS? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the challenges for the public sector is that, it's a great question, is that um, output is measured as input. So when I talk about measurement issues, so, you know, for things like the health service or education, um, what I said about that hour of work, I don't think their output is properly measured. Um, and then that has an impact on knock-on effect on wages, which is why I keep saying wages need to keep up with productivity, but we need to look very hard at how we measure it. So if your output is only your input, then you, you're just not measuring the contributions of people properly. So to me, given the importance of the properties about um, the public sector, especially um, you know, in advanced economies where we're lucky enough to have a welfare state and the, you know, uh, the you know and lucky enough to have um, the kind of health provisions that are available to us is absolutely essential you know to invest um, in the health service in you know in public services in care to me these are just things that you know um, uh, need to be thought of differently uh, than a private sector you know um, uh, wage improvement, for instance, but all of this is centered on measurement and productivity and having a concept as to what it is that you're hoping to achieve um, by measuring it, you know, and I think the ONS is actually trying to uh, measure services better than just looking at imports. So uh, is the UK property market crowding out investment? That's a good question. Um, you know, the... <laughs> For most households, uh, housing is your primary investment. That's very common. It's not just in the UK. Lots of countries um, you know, are like that. It's If you look at the share of investment, um, the kind of ultra wealthy have a have you know a bigger portion in portfolio investments, but you know most people is actually housing. Um, so, and what's fascinating is some research by a colleague of mine finds that forty percent of SMEs um, use their homes to secure their small business loans. So securitization of business loans reduces the cost of borrowing. So the squeeze on the housing market has this in probably, um, most people probably not aware of the link, has an impact on the growth of SMEs. And that is a real issue this year. So I would say, um, you know, um, absolutely, understandable to invest in bricks and mortar. Have you seen the stock market in the last few years um, and bond markets? Um, and I think it's this link to business loans um, that we probably need to think harder about because SMEs, they are the engine of growth and creation of employment. And if that's holding them back because they need to have securitized lending and you know that to me is, is one of the uh, things to, to think about for, for bigger companies who have access to capital markets um, and easier access to bank lending, the two things that hold them back are uncertainty and skills. We've talked about skills. There is a lack of um, vocational skills in STEM, which can be both vocational and higher education. Uncertainty holding investment back means that you have to have much longer term policy planning. So the government needs to set out what the growth strategy is, how to fund it, um, as well as what are the incentives in the fiscal uh, plans to help support innovation, investment in people. So I've always long said that every budget is a statement of how you want to shape the economy. Lots of people think of the budget as taxes and, you know, spending, but it's the choice of taxes and spending that shapes the economy. So is there a plan that all of these policies add together to support um, investment, which has a return in the future. I think that's going to be key. Um, oh, and I see on the chat, we will be ending shortly. So I think we've gone a couple minutes over time. So thank you all so much. What an amazing set of questions. <laughs> um, I really uh, enjoyed um, enjoy answering those. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for, uh, uh, for paying attention because um, I always worry because economics has been defined as the science of telling you things you've known your whole life, but in a language that you can't understand. So anyone who stays awake, I'm completely impressed by. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Linda, Dr. Yu. It's been a really refreshing talk. I mean, 
um, despite your distance, it, it feels like we're in a room chatting together. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, for someone like me who's studied astronomy and geophysics, why study three years in economics and then have a one hour Zoom call with you? <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But it's been, it's been really uh, interesting and learning and I, I will continue finishing our book. Thank you very much for attending and answering these questions and all the best in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fabulous Thank you. country for me to be in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye then. Thank you very much. Thank you.